how we will be looking at how pharmaceutical care can grow our sales and also retain our customers. So we have a guest here in the person of Dr. Akini Ajay. So Dr. Akini Ajay is a lecturer at UI and also is the CEO of Massey Pharmacy located here in Ibadan. So I will encourage every one of us to, I mean, listen to what Dr. Ajay has to say on this particular topic that is keeping up um, with um, pharmaceutical care to grow our sales and also to keep our clients or our customers to us. So at the end of the section, we'll treat your question, just put down your questions I'll take it one after the other to so that Dr. Ajay can attend to every question that you may have. Once again, good afternoon, Doctor, and welcome to the monthly webinar, RSO monthly webinar. You have the floor, Doctor. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to first ascertain that I'm audible. Can everyone hear yes. me? All right, yes, thank you very much. I want to say a very big thank you to RX Academy for having me. I don't take such things like this for granted. And it's always a pleasure speaking to my colleagues because I know I always know you have my back. Thank you so very much. Today we are looking at a very important topic, which is growing up, keeping up with pharmaceutical care. You know, that what they're keeping it up which is very, very important. And of course, how to grow, how to retain clients, I would like to rephrase, and grow sales with pharmaceutical care. This is very, very pertinent to us as people in the pharmaceutical world because business is everything. And in business, of course, you have to make good money to remain in business. And this is what we'll be talking about in a short while. And I'm sure we'll all have a good time. I'll also like to leave enough time so that you can have some time to actually discuss and ask ourselves with the question of necessity. So let's go to the slide two and set the ball rolling. Slide two, please. Next slide, please. Please, can you give me the next slide? Please, let's have the next slide. Wait, they should enable editing. All right. Now, this is what the outline look like. And without wasting much time, let's move on and move on to the very next item. Okay. Or would you enable me to share my screen? Yes, doctor, you can do that from your end. I think we're having uh, technical issues here. Okay. Yeah. Fortunately, I'm not sure they've given me that power to share the screen yet. Okay, someone is looking into that. Right. Okay. I think you should be able to do now. Yeah. You are the right now. Yes, sir. Thank you so very much. Okay. Right. Thank you so very much. And we're looking up from here, talking about pharmaceutical care. And I won't be going about this definition. For this definition of pharmaceutical care that we are all very familiar with, what really strikes me the most there are those first two words in red, responsible provision. And what it really means is that we take responsibility for any provision we make for our clients. It's not just about the medications alone. You know, we also offer some advice. Anything we do with patients, we take responsibilities. And let's note that all of this is geared toward two things. One, 
to achieve some definite outcomes and, of course, to improve a patient's quality of life. And the newer, the newer information there, what I loved about that is that it talked about our link with our physicians, other healthcare professionals, which is very important. I won't be dwelling much on this. This is information we already are familiar with. And then let's look at this. We now have expanding roles for pharmacists. You can imagine now, unlike before, it's not just about just selling medications alone. We are also involved in things like vaccination. I remember growing up then as a pharmacist, they used to tell us that ah, there are some things that are none of our business. What are you, what's the business with um, injection and things like that? And I ask myself, we are not, are we not overtrained to handle such things? We've done a lot in anatomy and physiology and everything. So what do we need? Just a little training on specifics and that's all. And thank God, COVID-19 came and it's no longer news. Like you know, pharmacy centers are now being approved. You not know, just it's elsewhere in our own Nigeria here for this kind of services. And then of course, patient referrals, patient education, screening services. If not for many pharmacies that will just run some medical outreach, that's where they get to know some people are very much on the eye when it comes to their blood glucose numbers and blood pressure, which people will naturally not go out to check in hospitals. And of course, my amen of minor amens. Of recent, a few weeks ago, in the UK now, they are, of course, not only are they advocating, pharmacists are given expanded roles of taking on some minor ailments in their community pharmacies just to relieve the GPs. And I mean, this guy is just the limit for us. And of course, medication therapy management. I'll move on. And yes, I know that pharmaceutical care comes with some challenges. And at times when you look at the challenges, you just feel like, am I cut out for this? But beyond the challenges, there are great opportunities. Some of the challenges could be time constraints. Yes, some of the good care does take time. But I'm telling you, the time is worth it because we'll have some things as rewards that will, I mean, meet up the requirement for the time. That, that the time is not wasted, it's actually invested. And then we have things that inadequate access to pertinent patient information. This is always a problem. Because at times when you see a position written that a patient has brought, you don't have the full picture. Some of the medications that are given there, you are wondering whether the dosage are too, too, too low or too high. You're not sure because you don't have the full picture. You don't even have information about the renal status of the patient, about the kidney status, about specific disease diagnosis. You don't know all of those times. It makes it difficult for us to be able to do something. I mean, having inf taking informed, um, informed decision taken on this. And then, of course, there isn't enough synergy between the healthcare practitioners. And it's all with what we all face. And then substandard quality of care in some healthcare facilities. I, I have a practice that has Maxi Pharmacy that I started before in 2012 before I joined UI. And there have been cases where I'll refer some of the patients to neighboring hospitals. Oh, go there, go ahead. They also have gone round. By the time they come, some of them will be so disturbed. Why did you bother sending me there in the first instance? That like, there was no value for my money there. I you know it it pains. I can't answer those questions. It bothers that I can't refer patients to to to, to healthcare facilities and and they come back and I get what I want from them. So that becomes an issue. And then this other aspect, and I've not even mentioned about the fact that as it were, pharmaceutical care is not really paid. As it were, I mean, there is no direct payment for it. Unlike elsewhere, and the one they are doing manage, uh, medication therapy management in the US, for instance, there is a pay for it for that extra work done. But I, but I really know that aside from all of those challenges, there are opportunities. For instance, you will have customer loyalty. And I think that's worth it. That's worth it because that's what will make your customers to, to, to identify your brand. You know, there's, I remember when I started in 2012. I learned that there were a couple of um, patent medicine dealers. I never bothered myself by knowing their location because this wasn't part of my business, not part of my job description. Mine was to face what I had to do. I have what I had in mind to do, and I face my world. And patients, even though, I know, of course, you can never beat the patent medicine dealers about price, price fighting, price war, because their overhead is rather low. You are paying pharmacies six digits. They are paying nobody. In fact, if somebody wants to come and learn how to do the work with them, they are even, those folks will even pay them. 
So their running cost is rather on the low. But despite that, and of course, I'm sure you know that they sell almost anything. But despite that, there is something that people would see and come back to your place. And that's part of, part of that is this pharmaceutical care. And I want to say that aside from the challenges, please, let's look through the opportunities. You know, word of mouth referrals, there is nothing that builds a company than that. When people that, that, have been, uh, that, that have been so excited by what you've given them, by your service towards them, they go around and talk to people, others, their friends, their colleagues, their, their, their relations about the service you have to render. And aside from that, it creates a professional presence for you and, of course, relevance. So let's move on. And then we're looking at, at this other point, which is very important, which is retaining clients growing sales. And we're looking at it from this perspective. Now, I'm putting the first thing there, especially as Remember, everything we're talking about is centered on this. How do you retain clients? And how do you grow your sales? One, specialization. I need to say a little bit about specialization. Specialization is not just about knowing everything about something. A professional for me, I define a professional as someone that knows something about everything. And he knows everything about one thing. And so when you are thinking about specialization, don't have it at the back of your mind that all I know is about diabetes patients. No, that's not who a specialist is actually. A specialist must have an idea of every other thing. Uh, you are not, you, of course, you can't be the king at everything, but have an idea about every other thing. And then you now specialize. For those in the medical world that those because those people that become special and, and consultants eventually, the first three years they spend going through all the fields under medicine. And then the next three years of the six-year program, they will now focus on a portion. And I want to say that aside from this aspect of specialization, please try to go around, read more, increase your learning, which is the second point. Increase your learning. No bits, it might be bits and pieces. It's important. For instance, can you imagine that somebody walks into your pharmacy and he, he has, let's say, scabies? And you just you just don't I don't have an idea what to do, or maybe another demand, or maybe your maybe just your your own your your own area of interest is just maybe say hypertension, and then you have little or no information about diabetes. That wouldn't be the specialist we have in mind when I'm talking about specialists. So I want to also get that aspect right. Get a lot of information about everything, but pick a couple of fields where you have interest and then specialize in that area. That would really help because patients they know where to go. I'm sure you know in even several hospitals, I'm talking about even now, private hospitals in Ibadan. We know, people know where to go for what's delivery because they've proven to have specialists in that area. Then the other aspect now is increase your pharmaceutical care services. No matter how the level you have gotten to, you can always increase, and we'll talk about that in the subsequent slides, and then ap apply the Pareto principle. Because one of the challenges with and it's okay, it's that aspect that it is time demanding, time consuming. And you only need 20% of the patient actually that will give the 80% of the effect you're looking for. And so I'm not saying that you should neglect some as it were, but you need to prioritize. We'll talk about this also because there are some patients that will need that will benefit more from pharmaceutical. Imagine somebody just walks in, a married, a married man, he comes to just take a, let's say just comes to buy his anti-malaria, or which he had been comfortable with, not that it keeps coming too frequently. It comes maybe say twice in a year. I'm not sure there will be much to talk to that person about pharmaceutical care. That's an acute illness. Or somebody who comes walks in to buy, say, condom. I mean, what are you going to be talking to that person? But there are some people that will come with pertinent issues that will say, no, this one, that will, that, that will raise some red flags. Oh, I think I need to monitor this. And then let's move on, which is talking about package your activities. I found out that this aspect as pharmacists, community pharmacists, we need to improve. If, for instance, you just do blood pressure for people and all you just do is cut one paper and write the result there and give it to them. Abba. Things can be better packaged. You can have a result sleep. You might even factor it into the bill for that. Or aside from that, you can even have a, a, a much more compiled pack, a key for that they can use for, say, six months, seven months, where you're keeping all their details. Of course, we won't give them free. They'll pay for that. That's part of packaging what you do. And of course, talking about what you do in a packaged manner. I remember then in the pharmacy where they were doing all this um, 10-year Framingham risk. I mean, cardiovascular risk. And it was way back over 20, almost 20 years ago. The person was charging about 20,000. But well packaged. 
And this is very important. Now, of course, customer loyalty program might help because customers, I mean, those programs, they attract them. And then the final one I'll be talking about, how to retain them, of course, is on the, you need to document your activities. It, it's happened to me. I'm not sounding like I do everything all the time. It's not all the patients that I, like, like I talked about prioritization. There are some I would not prioritize that. When they will come, they'll ask me, that drug you gave me the last time. And guess what? I, I don't even have an idea what the person was talking about. You know, it hurts. Ah, and the people will feel like, oh, so you don't even remember me. Can imagine when they come and the one telling them, ah, oh, I hope you're doing fine because you have documentation. And that's why I keep improving. And we too all should keep improving so that our services can be much more better than it used to be. Now, look at this. And we'll be talking about some of these other points in relation now to how to grow our business, how to, I mean, how to increase our clients because that's the way you will do, get this done. Look at medication therapy management. There are a lot of things. I'm just picking out these six points. A lot of things involved embedded in that medication therapy management. Can you imagine patients who just go to UCH, for instance, after they've been diagnosed, they say you have this one down, you give them medication. They ask them to come back. For some, the first time, maybe they might say come back in two or three weeks' time. After a while, they ask them to be coming back maybe in three, three months' time. Now, what happens between when they leave the hospital for the checkup and the next three months? What if their blood pressure goes lower than it should be? What if their blood sugar is getting as low as 60 milligrams per deciliter when they are already having hypoglycemia, which is even worse than hyperglycemia? Who handles that? And the patient can die actually of that faster than even hyperglycemia would be responsible. So that's where pharmacists would come in. And if you're not there for them on things like that, how will you be able to retain them? How will you be able to grow your sales? The first one there is pharmacoeconomics. I've seen cases where patients are, are, are told to buy some very costly medications, which is beyond their monthly salary. Not that they don't want to buy, but they can't, just can't afford it. I don't want to mention any specific brand. It's not about any brand now. But when they can't afford it, and if, if, if a physician don't even ask them, they don't ask them about can they afford all they just do is just manage the time they have and give them what they think they should go and take. Now, if somebody is earning is earning 60,000 and the drug it will take per month is about 40,000. I mean, you already know the answer. The person will have to be smart, except he has some other forms of um, income. And I've seen patients who take their drugs every other day. I've asked, I said, how do you expect me to cope? I can only afford 20,000 for this drug. And it should be, the, the full dose is 40,000. So I can take it every other day. That's the only smart way I can cope around it. And we know that that's not going to be helpful in the long run. Rather than take a patient through that, why not cheaper medications? I mean, I'm not talking about the raw bottom one that you're not sure of the quality. As we have the peak, maximum product, peak product, we also have some medial one that can stand in very well. And as community pharmacists, those are areas of strength. You know, like physicians, they will keep coming back to you. So they will tell you, the drug you gave me didn't work. So you can always keep track of what they're doing and how they're fearing with their medication. So pharmacoeconomics, both ways, we have to be able to balance. If a patient can afford those ones, of course, they will get more benefit from me. Fine. But if they cannot afford it, that's where we come in. And we could help these patients to get better benefits. And when they know that you're always there for them as regards that, you are, their, you are their physician. In fact, they will be calling you doctor. And rightly so, because you are the one who is taking care of them. The other one is on medication reconciliation. I had my PhD thesis on this, and it will shock you even at our big from, uh, UCH. Well, I was finding out from patients. A patient who is on three different brands of metformin, another two different brands of, 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 of um, glyburn climate. Because he's just there. He's just taking, I don't know how they come down with that. And he's taking all of those things. That's not what they, they is pretending to just take one, but they are taking different brands. Because they don't know. They go to, to, to the pharmacy, they buy this one. The ones that don't have available, they go to another pharmacy. That one will give them everything again. And on and on like that. And those are things that we can do. With medication reconciliation, all we want to do is also be sure that the patient is taking exactly what he is, he is meant to be taking. You know, some patients are also, uh, they visit more than one physician. He goes to physician A, he gives him a list of drugs. He goes to physician B, he gives him another list. He gives another, another I know, an example of it is that they might give multivitamin, for instance. He goes to an ophthalmologist. He gives him a, maybe a, 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 an, an, an ophthalmic preparation that's in capsule form, which is just like an antioxidant. That also answers to the other part of the body. 
he goes to uh, another person, maybe his cardiologist, he gives him another one, and then we are having multiple multivitamins that is not necessary. And usually when they go to see a physician, a, a specialist in one field, he's not asking them what other things they are taking. He's not part of his own business. They work in silos as it were. He just does his own and leaves, especially when they are not in the same hospital. And these are areas where we can come. Aside from those ones, don't forget that people also have inverted uh, doctors they visit. Some of those doctors are their friends that they perceive to be well knowledgeable in medical fields. Some of those doctors are people that works as uh, patent medicine dealers. I saw one, this, I mean, that, 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 uh, one of the people that came from one of them and I saw the drugs that he gave to the person and I was asking myself, what's the rationale for this? With so much confidence. And you know, all of these things, it's only us that will be able to help them to reconcile this medication. Then the next one is point of care, testing and patient monitoring. This is what we will be able to do. Just like I said, they've left the, the hospital and they have to come back in three months. We some of them won't even go. You are the ones that could help them out. Do their health checks for them. Oh, you, are, you have diabetes. Oh yeah, do your fasting blood sugar. Do this one, do that. And you'll be monitoring. Oh yeah, come back in so-so time. And let's check how it's going. Oh, now this you have to make amendments to your medication based on the current reading or your blood pressure reading. That's what pharmacists could be able to assist with. Okay, the other one, identification and resolution of drug therapy problem. Who will do that more than pharmacists? Of course, we are the ones trained for that. And you could make use of this to better the life of patients. I'm telling you, if in your pharmacy you are focused on some of these things, you will see that patients will recognize you as their care provider. As their care provider because they know that they get added uh, tax and uh, value for everything they, 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 they buy from you. You're not just selling. What about patient compliance to medication? And not only medication. Let's take diabetes for instance. There are three tripods on which they are the, the prognosis rests on. One is pharmacotherapy, which we all agree with. The other one is education on their exercise. Exercise. And the third one is on diet. If all they are doing is just even uh, adherence to their medications, it's not going to be enough. If they are still not, not controlled with their diet, if they are not careful also with their exercise, they won't get maximum benefits. And all of these are things that pharmacists can help them. You might say, you should have told them in the hospital, it will shock you that physicians are so, so busy. And the physician to patient ratio is not encouraging. It's not encouraging. We have so few physicians in relation to the number of patients that are available. So as pharmacists, we are there for them. And I'm sure some of you might be thinking that, where is the time to be talking to them? Hey, do you know that you can actually schedule appointments with these patients? It will shock you. We know we all have different peak periods. Maybe it's in the evening that is peak period in your pharmacy and somebody is coming at that time. Of course, that's not the time to start uh, saying so many things. If at that time, you have to make best use of time. You could reschedule maybe around 10, maybe around 12 when the, the peak period is not, as, is not in that region. You have a little more space. And you, it will shock you. They will come even weekends. They will come because they value their own. We are talking about somebody's health care. Yeah. And then, of course, this will go more. We see that medication therapy management, of course, is much more applicable for patients with chronic disease. That was what I was trying to talk about earlier on, talking about prioritization of pharmaceutical care. It's not everyone will have to spend so much time on, but you have to, part of the reason why you might need to process for is for somebody who has diabetes or who has hypertension. You know, they are going to be on drug for the rest of their life, maybe. And of course, for those people, you need to. I mean, have a lot of care with them. Now, look at this other one we're looking at. There is about point of care testing. And of course, there are many of such listed right, right here, which I would like to quickly go through. I would like to say that, please, be consistent in the documentation of their results. The idea I would also give, I will give an address, please. You may want to create maybe a, maybe a, maybe a pamphlet, maybe a booklet, their results, don't just give it to them in sheets of paper. It might be a cardboard well designed in and out where you can make available spaces for dates and then the results. That is something they can take back to their physicians and if you give them a track record of what their results have been, it might shock you that many patients don't bother about all they just do is at the end of the day after, maybe after 30 months, they just go that day and do the blood pressure reading at the hospital. You know, you and I know that that is not going to be as effective 
as the one that gives us the full picture over a range of time. That one is a lot better. It's a lot more dependent, dependable because it gives us the, the, the trend. And that's what physicians would prefer. You can help them out in that area. Of course, we won't do design that and give them for free. I mean, package it and they, they, should, they will be willing, more than willing to have it. And you to encourage them when they are coming, they should come with that. In fact, in some pharmacy, they even keep it in the pharmacy. Anytime they are going to their clinic, it's okay, you can go with it. And of course, you can also keep a back-end copy on your own area. Now, the other one is regular monitoring of disease progression. I want to be with us as pharmacists. Let's do this. At times, you might be thinking that, what how am I so Am I the physician? No. You are the healthcare provider that is closest to them. Do you know that some of them, depending on the kind of hospital they go, they attend. That was what I was telling us earlier on. It is shocking that somebody who is who has a diabetes, for instance, they've never done his renal check, no check on his kidneys. They just put him on, say, med for me. They don't even know if his kidney can handle it. And the person is on drugs, no check on the on his on his vital. But these things you can help them out. For those people, you know, I'm not. Of course, you can't do that in a pharmacy, but you can recommend them to go to labs to go do that. It's unlike in those areas that people are hiding so many things. They can go to lab and, for instance, EU creatinine. Let's know what level. I'm sure as pharmacists, we can interpret that. We are overtrained for so much underutilized. You can help them out with that. And of course, you do that result for ask them to go and do it in a reputable lab. I must also mention that there are many labs now. And some of the results, they, they churn at us. At times, I'm asking myself, did I send someone to a lab or did something go wrong somewhere? This one will shock you. Somebody I asked to go and do um the, uh, sensitivity test, and he came back and the person said it's uh, the, the the medication uh, the my microorganism is resistant to rosefin, but sensitive to a brand of ceftriaxone monotiton. So how can that be? As how can that? Of course, when you look at things like that, it should help you to know that this is not where you want to send anybody to. And patients are very, very sensitive. You might be thinking that in some other places they are charging more. Patients don't mind though, because it's their lives. It's their lives. They don't do it every every other day. So these things you can send them to a lab, and when they come with the result, keep a copy of it. Ask them to go see their physicians. Any physician, and you don't just give them a verbal referral. Make something written. Make it a written referral and keep a document of it i'm telling you those physicians when they need when the chiefs are down they know where to refer those patients they know you know what you're doing please this can be something we could help and of course the one we can do in our pharmacy things like their fasting blood sugar things like their blood pressure measurement we can do all of those things we can help them out with that and keep a record now this other one is on patient education on acquiring self-monitoring devices imagine if you educate them to buy it, where do you think they will buy it? Of course, they will buy it at your pharmacy. Yes, I know that some of those devices, the prices have gone up, but patients won't mind. It's about their lives. And please, I also want to say that, please, make sure you do educate them on this. The best way that will make them to be committed, to take responsibility for their care, which you call self-care, is when you are, they are able to measure their vital values, their objective values by themselves. Then somebody does, for instance, now, Somebody goes to a party and he eats carelessly the, over the weekend and he does his fasting blood sugar in the morning and he sees the value spike. You don't need to preach to him. He already knows that, oh, I'm so I'm reaping from what I sold over the weekend. Though. And that will help him naturally to do what is right. Please, these are very, and aside from just making them, seeing them be by, please educate them on how to use this. It will shock you that many patients don't know how to use ordinary uh, BP monitors. How do they just use it? They just put it on. They do it one time. They see the reading, and that's what they write. And you and I know that you cannot take the first reading and go to town with that. You need to do it for at least to see two consecutive readings within five minutes of mercury dispersion. Those things are we need to educate them on all of this. And these things you can also read it up on 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 on, on the internet. It's not like in those days you don't need to go and get a big test. We can get it all over the place. Just be sure that you use right sources. So that the information you are providing is one up to date and is also reliable because in, 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 in the medical world, the only thing constant is change. Now, I talk about expanding your service. I won't be surprised if many pharmacists don't even have peak flow meters. And I ask myself, how do you monitor your patients that have asthma? 
And it's not you that will monitor it because this is a personalized point of care uh, testing kit. They have to buy their own. This is what we tell them when they need to go and see a physician. This is when you need to tell them to know what is when they need to use their rescue medication. But I see that many don't even bother about. And this is, I mean, they are going to buy if you make it available and explain why they need to buy it and educate them on how to use it. We do not have increased your sales. They will. You will have done that. And truth is that they are going to tell someone. You know, those people, they have associations. They have communities. Community of patients with asthma. It will shock you. They know themselves. And they will say, look, go to that place. They gave me something. You know, it's been very helpful. The other one, body mass index. It's so easy. All you need to, to, to do is just a, a weight measuring device and a, the height measuring device. And there you go. There you go. The weight in kilogram divided by the square of the height in meters. And then you have body mass index. And this will give you a better indication on, on the obesity level of the patients. Then let's look at the other one, packed cell volume. I'm not saying you should go and take the uh, blood from their vein like other that I love to do. There are point of care testing kits. As if you are just doing uh, fasting blood sugar, that blood is enough. And it will tell you the PCV level. What about fasting lipid profile? You might want to say, ah, this seems to be, it's not costly. You just buy a device. I had to buy one several years ago and it's been very helpful. How can somebody be, be, be diabetic or have hypertension and the person accesses care in your pharmacy? And you don't have an idea what their fasting lipid profile is. If they have this lipidemia, don't you know that will affect the quality of the results you get with all the medication. They are just increasing the doses of medication. But this aspect is yet to be dealt with. You know, in our drug therapy program, this is an untreated indication as it were. But if you do not use this to assess, to have been sure that there is a problem, then you're just overshooting the drugs when actually you just need to improve, improve on the lumen. I mean, for better blood transfer. It is important. And of course, all of these things, you want to get involved in it. There are companies. Each time I go for SPM, I see these things are displayed by companies. Fifth meter, fasting lipid profile, even glycosylated hemoglobin, HbA1c for diabetic patients is displayed. And the only thing is I'll just advise that don't rush into getting them. Do your own work. Profile everything. What are the number of patients we have? Speak to them ahead of time about the need for them to do this HbA1c, say at least once in a year. And by the time you're able to get their commitment on that, then you can move on. And of course, plan it and then get committed to working on that. So let's move. And don't forget all these things we are talking about are ways that you can increase your sales. And you can imagine if you offer these services for patients. Why would they not stay? They will not only stay, they will bring other some of their friends to make sure that they are on the same place because they are appreciating and they enjoy the quality of, of, of service that you are providing. And now, what about patient-specific counseling? This is so, so vital. Because there is no, no one-size-fits-all counseling. Different patients, there will be different things to tell them based on their specificity. Somebody is already on the normal, maybe on, even on their weight. You're telling him he has to lose weight so that he can improve. Really, that's not, that's not patient-specific. Then what about health literacy consideration? Not everybody can access health information and interpret correctly. And please, I'm not talking about educational literacy. Some people are high up in the educational cadre, but they are very low there when it comes to health literacy. And for such people, you might need to find ways to speak to them in simple terms. One of the ways you could help them is by asking them to tell you back what you just told them, to be sure they understood. You know, some people, they are too educated. They, they feel that, what do you want to tell me about this thing? And it will shock you when they get the, when the chips are down and they are at home to use the medication. Ordinary uh, sabotamol inhaler. They don't. You are trying to tell them how to say, "I know it," because they feel too big to be told that. And then they they, they don't know what particular li linking means, and then they do it the wrong way. The other one, medication adherence and compliance. Please, I want to play with us. We need to work more on this. You know, a drug, no matter how potent a drug is, it will never be effective for a patient if it has not been ad administered. We need to also be deliberate about how we ask them. You know, you don't just ask a patient, uh, I hope you are taking your drugs regularly. What do you expect him to say? He will say no. Of course, you have asked him a leading question. Of course, he says yes. But you have to be much more deliberate. 
at times, you know, you just tell them, you know, it's, I know people forget to take their drugs for one reason or the other, maybe once or twice in three days. I just want to find out from you. Let's look at the last one or two weeks. Is it up to three or four times you forgot to take your medications? Not asking them that way. You're already making them to have a soft mind that you are. Chibis, you are talking about it. It's only once, it's only twice I forgot to. And this is for their own good. But if you tell them, I hope you take your drugs regularly. What else do you expect them to say? Of course, you will say yes. Nobody will say no to that kind of a question. And our questioning skills is very important. We need to improve also on that to help our patients more. The other one is compliance with hospital appointments. Please help them with this. Talk to them about this. Because we are not, what we are doing you know, is not, we are not trying to, I mean, keep them with us. No, they need to go on because there are more tests they will do there. And once they know that you're always, you, are, you have their back, everything you are doing is about their, is patient focused. Remember that definitely, it's patient centered. They, they will keep coming to you because they know you have good intentions for them. Now, this is very important to keep track of your practice. Document consistently. And pharmacies, please, document in a consistent or, um, order. And then why don't you publish your findings? You do medical outreach, you have over 50 people, over 100 people attend. You should have worked hard on this ahead of time. Plan it ahead of time. Can I write a paper on this? Seek ethics approval. You may, you may liaise with someone who is in the academia if you're not comfortable or you're not uh, conversant with the way they write some of this. It's not anything different. We see a lot of our colleagues abroad. They do a lot of paper in community pharmacies. You are sitting on data. A lot of patients walk in and out every now and then. I've had a couple of that done with some pharmacies. You can also be involved in this. Do that. It's also, it, it, it puts you in the limelight. Somebody just, just Google your pharmacy. All they say are just the things you sell. All these things are also important. Keep track. It is when you keep track, you'll be able to, for instance, I, you know, I would tell some people, I said, look, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether we are still in the era of doing free medical checkup for people. I don't think people even still attend such medical checkups. Because there is nothing, they just do blood pressure, blood sugar, those things. In our level, at this level, you should be inviting med, uh, physicians, specific. So you may, may, of course, it might be a general practitioner. You could invite an endocrinologist. It could be a cardiologist. It could be, and patients will pay. It's part of our pharmaceutical care services to them. Because they know if they go to the physicians, they know how much you'll be all about ophthalmologists. A lot of people that have it's all about dentists. Just make sure you get the right set of people. People will be willing to pay for such services. And when they come, can pay as much as 1000 This is what I've done in my own practice sites for patients. They know how much they will pay if they go to, to find, to get those physicians. And you know, we're all doing these things to help them to get to be better. As I'm trying to round up because of time, I need to mention about the use of medication information apps. Because at times at pharmacies, we feel inadequate. When people ask us for something and information about drug that is drug related and you don't have it off time, pharmacists, please, let's not deceive ourselves. You're not robots, you're not computers, that you don't have an information about drug off and doesn't make you less a pharmacist. In fact, you're not supposed to have all the information about drugs off hand. The important thing we need from you is information retriever. If I ask us on this panel now, and I ask us to vote, tell you what is the dosage of, of, of amipenem. Majority of us might not be familiar with it. Does it make you less than a pharmacist? By no means. It's just that in your area of practice, you have not been exposed to that medication. So what? That's not any problem. But I'm sure if I ask you as a pharmacist, you know where to find information about any pen and whatever drug works to help. So we need all these quick reference and medic medical information apps. An example that I've put here is Medscape. There was one I used to use. I love it so much, Hippocrates. Now they've, they've restricted it to just um, um, users in, in, in the United States of America. No longer can people outside there use it. I so much love it. Well, Medscape is okay. I'm, I'm coping with that. You can get a lot. You want to check interaction with medications, even if it's up to 10 medications, you can keep them in one after the other. And then you can get interactions checked up. Or you, at times somebody is asking you, is there going to be an interaction within this and this? And you feel bad that you don't have the answer off hand. Are you supposed to have it offered? When you are not, if I look once or die, you're not supposed to have everything off hand. I mean, I know there are some conventional ones you should have off hand, no problem. But you cannot have everything. And there is no shame in checking out. In fact, it makes you a professional. So don't let us shy away from this. But you need to get those information. Get them. It can be on your phone. In fact, for this, don't go and um, apply for the one that you have to be paying for. You don't need to pay for this one. 
the lower one is okay for us. And you will get a lot more information about medications. It really does for the health. So please, uh, we have this one. We also have micromedics. We also have MMDEX. There are many ones. Get it. It will really help. And as you are getting to detail now, I've mentioned this, but I just want to go over it. Prioritizing patients. Please use the Pareto principle. You cannot do pharmaceutical care with every Tom, Dick, and Harry that visits your pharmacy. There are some. Maybe they just send it to come and buy something. I mean, you need to sit down and look at the Pareto principle. Pick the 20% that will contribute 80% to the work you're doing. And as you are picking with them, I mean, if you do consistently with those 20%, over time, it becomes like an auto run. I worked as a medical representative. I did that for about 10 years of my life. I left there as a regional manager. I knew when I started the work, it was much involving. But over time, some of them became like auto run. By the time some of those other patients become auto run, you can leave a little space, pick some. And if you do that, before you know it, you have a big pool of, of patients who are really following up. And then decide the criteria for prioritization. I, you are the one that will decide it based on the prevailing circumstances in your pharmacy, maybe based on chronic diseases, like I've said, those who have diabetes, who have hypertension, maybe they have um, um, arthritis and things like that. Or maybe those on polypharmacy. Or maybe they've had um, um, past issues about non-medication adherence. That could be one thing. And then I want to also say that, please, leverage technology. When you leverage technology, you go a long way to help with this because if you reduce some of the paperwork you do, to make sure that you are able to get information in a small computer. And then, of course, you want to look for an information rather than looking for papers manually. All you need to do is control F. You find what you are looking for is there right away. And then, I've mentioned this earlier, you can schedule appointments for low traffic hours for patients. There is a lot to say about this, but I know that time is criminally gone. So, I think I, think I should stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. You, you might want to take questions now. And again, I want to thank Avex Academy for this. I don't take it for granted. Thank you so very much. Well, thank you so much, Doctor, for this um, comprehensive um, presentation. You're it's welcome, quite sir. interesting and also a lot of points to take out from this presentation. Thank you so much, Doctor. Please, yes. let's keep the um, questions coming so we can, doctors can attend to our questions as they are coming in. So why saw, waiting for the I saw one yes. on the chat box. Yes, that's what I'm about to take. Oh, thank you. This question is from Abdukabir Ahmed. So he's trying to know how to how do we ensure patient follow up visit to hospitals? Hmm. In particular big... in Nigeria during this economic um inflation change. Inflation challenges. challenges. I really appreciate that question. And I will say this that. One of the ways is that when you are sending them, number one, write a referral letter. Number two, ask them to come back after they, are, they have seen their physicians. And yes, you might not be able to ascertain on especially when it's a teaching hospital. Yes, if it were to be a private hospital, it's much easier. I, be, I want to believe that the ph pharmacies and the hospitals around you should already have a relationship, a working relationship with them. Or you can even call them, I've, I'm sending social patient to come and see you. That way you're able to ascertain because you can ask them to go and see a physician. They may never go. But another thing is when you tell them once you are done, whatever you come up with them, can I have a feedback? They should come up with something. And with that, if they won't go, it will be very, very obvious. And then uh, talking about the economic inflation, the truth is that as much as things are getting, we're uh, having a lot of infl inflation. The truth is that, in fact, it creates more opportunities for us as pharmacists. People will prioritize what they what they perceive to be very important to them. And their health, they will not but get their dose. Look at augmenting, for instance. The price has gone up and so many other products. People not buying, they will buy. So I don't want us to think that that might be far. They know they will still, they will still. Let me hold on there because of time. Thank you so much, Doctor. Um, at the Kabir Ahmed, I believe um, you have, you are satisfied with um, the answer provided by doctor. So I have another question here from Sterling Diza. How easy will it be to charge customer during current economic climate? Hmm. That's a big one. But you won't, the, the, there, are, there are subtle ways of, in, 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 I, mean, I mean, putting on the charges. For instance, 
you can just design something on your uh, the way you put in drugs, design a name and put a price on it. And depending on the quality of time you spend with the person, let's assume that the minimum of it is 100 Naira. You may want to make it up to five, depending on the service you render to the person. In the invoice you're going to be giving the person, there is no pharmaceutical cost charge written there. It's something you have coded. And then it's part of what they will pay for. That's one way. Another way is also by the the, the point of care testing you are going to be doing. For instance, the PCV, you can make a lot of money on the PCV. But when they do it outside, they do they spend thousands on needs. And once you buy the, the machine, the streets are not that costly. But you make sure your prices matches the market prices that you don't see as you go to add them is less of a less quality. That way you can also find a way to make up for it. And some other things, for instance, the fasting blood sugar, you can make extra money on that one. And I feel that those are ways, aside from making direct charges, when you want to mention direct charges, it might make some patients who want to drop back. I think these are indirect way of making it work. Thank you. All right. So the next question from the same person is, um, how do you deal with hospital challenging pharmacists on some services and bad mouthing pharmacists? Well, never let it bother you because it's not going to end. Like I told you, I growing up as a pharmacy student, they used to tell us, you don't have any business with injection. It's not your deal. It's not any company, all this and that. You are not, it's not your area of specialization. I asked them, what is my area? Why did I spend that number of years studying anatomy and physiology? You know? And some of these people will say all of these things, but by the time you are now successful at that thing, the same people will come and, and, and celebrate you. Never mind if they are just be sure that what you are doing, you have, you have the, I mean, the backing. Of the law, don't 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 withdraw your service. They say hey, you're almost becoming doctor. Hey, can you can you are doing. You know, be sure that you are working in uh, within the confines of the law as a pharmacist. Never mind. They will. Uh, even, it's only dead people that people don't talk about. Look at. I'm sorry. Look at our current government. Don't you know all that people said before he became president? Our uh, president. People said so many things. Put out so many things on the social media. He's president now. He is never uh, irrespective of what people have said. So don't never let what anybody will say. The focus you have is what should keep you going. Thank you. All right, even though some still claim it's not our president, it's not their president. I will let them say that you're on their own. <laughs> <laughs> I see so somebody the last question from somebody yeah, is so the, Let's take the third one from Sterling before we okay. proceed to Ahmed. So the last one from Selin is, how do you navigate clinical condition and patient social and religion belief? Now, this aspect takes a lot of time. Look, there are many patients when you are talking to them, they are just doing what I call agama agama. They are just nodding. In Kotoma, their, their minds are made up about what they would do. What they are telling them, they don't agree with you. And that was why I was careful about using the word medication adherence because most of the time in Nigerian hospitals, I don't think there's anything like medication adherence. To. It's medication compliance. You just tell them, go and use this. She cannot. But the right thing is to make sure that they are involved in the decision taking. Give them the options and tell them why you are picking this over this and why they may feel otherwise. When people are involved in decision taking, they own the decision by themselves. That's the way it runs. So, in clinical conditions, when you are not careful about their beliefs, somebody is in Ramadan time of fasting, you're telling him to go and be using uh, ampi clocks four times in a day. You're just doing agama. You are just <laughs> saying your own. But if you are with the person, that's why we take all of those social demographic information in their case notes. You see that this person is a Muslim. Oh, this is a fasting time. Is there something you can take twice a day? You say, I'm fasting. But you can tell the person, Abba, when you want to, I mean, eat in the morning, you can take that. And when you are breaking at night, you can take that and I'll say, fine. So for me, if you don't involve patients, some of them will not say anything. But what they will do is in the back of their mind. So you have to involve them. It's not like, because I see maybe they shout down patients and I really don't like it. In fact, I don't want it in pharmacies at all. People shout down. I see they are shouting others at them. They are, they are forcing something down their throats. You should involve them. You're talking about their life, not your own life. Thank you. All right, thank you, Doctor. Uh, Sterling, I believe your question is uh, your questions are answered. And another one from Abdul Kabir: How do we undo prescribers that insist that their patient be given branded products, e.g., augmenting, when it's now, not based, available in the hospital pharmacy? Now, based on my little experience, when some uh, physicians will insist 
they have their reasons. For instance, I know of different, I've worked with some, I've worked with some companies and I know some products that sells for about 10% of the branded products. I don't always preach generic substitution all the time. That's the importance. Because when you do generic substitution for some products, it becomes a problem. For instance, somebody is about to put to bed and they needed augmenting or they or maybe a child is having issues and they said they want to say thing at all costs. I'm not saying that others might not be able to meet up, but the truth is that from what we clinical, I mean, um, experiences we've seen, when they go on to some brand or um, some unbranded ones, they don't give the same um, for the same um, therapeutic outcome. And that is true, and I'm sure you've seen that with some brands of medications. Even let's say it's even easier to do that among patient medications for diabetes. It's important. So when a, a physician insists. Let's give him, they have to, they might, let's say they have the right to do this, allow them. They might have a reason. If you don't, for instance, at the moment now, nobody has it as it was. Some people still do. So if he's not available, tell him these are the options we have. Let him decide. By the time he goes all around and he can't find it anywhere, let's see whether he'll go and manufacture one. Of course, he will come back and take the available. Not that you don't want to stock it now. It's just because you can't find it elsewhere. And we are careful about stocking it from anywhere, lest we get a fake version of it. Thank you. All right, very quick one. Uh, in few minutes, less than a minute, I have this question from coming from University of uh, Paraku in Benin Republic. So this question is: This person is trying to know. You mentioned extended pharmacy care, pharmacies like blood pressure measurement, other screening are for pharmacies licensed for this, or it's just supplementary aspects. Oh, so patent medicine dealers in Nigeria also do same things. Are they giving authorization for it by pharmacists or how? Now, I want to say that as pharmacists, there are some things that are not written. For instance, to do blood pressure for a, for a patient, is it written anywhere that you are, you are licensed to do this? But you are licensed to give pharmaceutical care. And these are things subsumed under pharmaceutical care. This was a law. This was a fire. I remember during the COVID period, do you know that there, there are pharmacists in, in, in the U.S. who were involved in COVID-19 testing? It's not what I heard, though. I was on the, on, on the meeting while this was being reported. They were doing COVID-19 testing because they just got interested in helping out. And aside from that, of course, even in the U.S., people are more comfortable taking their vaccination in community pharmacies than in hospitals. Do you know that they are now being given official validation for it now? And they are now expanding the level of vaccination they are, or their immunization they are given in the U.S. based on all of those things. Now, if they did not move out and recognize it as their area of, 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 of help, they will forever sit on the, on the, on the, on the fence and be saying they don't have direct certification for this who certifies who now if i may ask who is more qualified to handle this than we pharmacists we should be able to handle this it's part of our partner right. training so i believe that this are thing we are not going out of our boundaries no we are not this is they, they call it point of care testing and I, may i surprise you that even in hospitals in the u.s i've seen where for instance even ordinary uh, lipid uh, some, some of these tests they ask them to go to the pharmacy there to do the test and the pharmacist will be will be the one to give them advice for instance on warfarin monitoring physicians don't bother themselves about that but at times we cover ourselves we make it difficult for ourselves to expect for what we are pharmacists now adequately trained right. thank you okay thank i think we should attend um... to the person who is raising in his hand <laughs> Okay. All right. Um. Okay. Because of our time, I think okay. we have to take some other question here before we call it a day now. So let's take this one from um Sterling once again. Okay. What's your opinion on upper medicine? the type being sold in packs and how best can you convince a patient against it? 
maybe I'll advise that don't bother yourself. Because these <laughs> patients, their minds are made up. And you cannot say 100% that they are not effective. Mm -hmm. It's just that you don't want them to take them side by side with the prescribed medication. For instance, when you're talking about Abiamese, I hope you know it's very broad. People that are taking Efene, for instance, Ewudo, for instance, which is their normal meal, in their mind is an herbal medicine that works for them. And you cannot divorce psychology from medicine. If that's what they want to take, the only thing is ask them, please don't take it alongside the time you are taking your medications. And as much as possible, ask them to bring what they are taking. If you just told, for instance, what about, I hope you know this thing is not just in Nigeria. We have devil's claw. It's very, very effective for pain. And some other things like that. There are many of them. Don't don't just um, tell them, no, don't use it. If you tell them that, they will just nod in your presence. They just tell them, hey, this one doesn't know what's happening around. Ask them to let you know what exactly they are taking. Find out from what sources. The only thing is that you want to be very sure it's not the one, those ones that are walking all around the place to be sure that it is well made. It is the one that they cut some leaves and they... If they claim it was for this, maybe they take vegetables as well. Let them take it. The only thing that don't let them take it alongside because all the drug drug interaction, drug vegetable, drug herb interaction has not been documented. So and you don't know what will happen. A couple of them have been found. For instance, warfaring with some of these about things. We've seen that. But if we want that we don't see, make them make sure that they avoid mixing it all together. That's all I can say. But because to convince them to not use it, try, but most of them won't listen based on the experience that I've found. Thank you, sir. Okay, hello, doctor. Hello. So there is another one here from Techno. Is drug prescription primary role of a pharmacist or a medical or medical doctors? Yes, it depends on what prescriptions you are talking about. If a patient walks into your pharmacy, for instance, and he needs a medication and anti-malaria. It's something you should be able to handle. Are you going to refer him to the hospital to go and like, treat anti-malaria? It will shock you that I was in a meeting where a physician from a very from a tertiary hospital was saying that we, we, we don't know why we're having patients coming here because of pneumonia. You know that um, um, community acquired pneumonia, they don't want to see those patients in the hospital because one, they are immunosuppressed as much as possible and they don't want them to have any engagement with nosocomial infection. They want it to be treated in outpatient basis in community pharmacies. That's why we have to I mean, increase our level of practice. How do you make, how do you work on that? The prescription, there are some of the things you can handle. Like that's why I said minor, in, if I, in the UK, that's what they are factoring in as you are speaking. That's what they are factoring in as you are speaking. Now, they already asked them to be handling some. Because we are we understand some of this. I'm not saying that you want to go and be answering, I mean, uh, uh, measuring and working on things like a cancer and things that are beyond your view. And don't be, I mean, we should not be greedy about it. The things you know you don't have competence in. I mean, stay out of it. Or you can read up, for instance, things on asthma. You can help. You know, do you think that it's in the hospital they will be able to diagnose asthma for the first time? You might be the one who would have gotten it by just, I mean, I mean, assessing a patient. And that's important. So for me, there is no other and fast food around drug prescription role of pharmacists. In fact, we have pharmacists prescribed even in the UK because they've gone through some specific training. The only thing, the only issue I have with it is that please make sure you are well trained to handle some of those things. Make sure you have read enough. For instance, now many pharmacies don't even know the current um, American Diabetes Association guideline for treatment of diabetes. The one, the current um, GINA guideline for treating um, a patient with asthma. The one for hypertension. You are not reading up. The one you knew in school is what was still want to be practicing. That would be obsolete, of course. So that is in that area. Let's measure. You know, they say keeping up with pharmaceutical care. The aspect of keeping up is reading up more so that you are relevant. The information you are providing is valid. That aspect, let's go all out for that. But in the aspect of prescribing, I mean, there are some minor ailments. Somebody is coming with saying, well, vaginal candidiasis, minor, minor, oral root structure, and things like that. You want to ask them to go to the hospital. So those are things you should be able to handle as a pharmacist in your community pharmacist setting. And you're not uh, going outside you. of the law. Okay. Another one here from Uluwa Shum. So he's asking, what is your view about extended various types of max up hmm. all pharmacy use to sell their drugs? So do you think the Pharmacy Council of Nigeria should regulate this whereby different locations have a unique selling markup? 
which can make the pharmacy business profitable? It's, it's, thank you for this question. The problem is that if you look at those who, who have um, cited within shopping malls, the amount they pay to get that space, you can never compare with those who are working in, in, in some other area. So how do they have the same, how do they use the same markup? How are they going to meet up? That becomes a challenge. And also because it, the sources of medications is not unified. People get from different sources at different prices. Some are strong and viable enough to get directly from the company. Some are not buoyant enough. They get from those who get from those, those other ones, middle line distributors. So in the long run, they will, it will come at the higher price because if you don't keep a good markup, you'll be out of business in no time. And unlike what obtains in some other climes where everything is regu regulated, even the pharmacy sector is not even well regulated. Price is even the least of our concern. All these drugs now, they are being sold in all these patent medicine dinners, antibiotics, so everything, no. So how do you regulate in that area also? So it's a lot of problem. It's, like, it's an ideal position, but <laughs> we are far from it. But I know we'll get there someday because I can see the point in what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So this one is coming from Adi Bayo Adini. Thank you, Dr. Adi, for the wealth of experience here. You mentioned in one of your slides that fascination could be a new area of practice where community pharmacies can expand their roots to the patients. So he's trying to ask, what is your take on the issue of pharmacies dressing a wound? All right, thank you for the question. It depends on your area of interest. And it depends on the type of wound we are talking. There are some superficial wounds. You know, for instance, you know that you don't even need to be a pharmacist to handle this. I was, I, there was a scenario that played out somebody. I was going somewhere and I saw a man that had epileptic seizure feature. He was coming up with epileptic seizure. And I saw everybody rubbing up and they said, go and get water, go and get water and pour on it. I just went on the side and I took him, asked him to step on the side and I used my leg to guide him. I knew about how to handle that. And I became the professional on the spot. But if I didn't know anything about epileptic seizure, and you're helping them to carry water. And after you say you're a pharmacist, they wonder, ah, you are not different from us now. Imagine many people have accidents on the road, on the road, on the express. Don't you see people dressing their wound, helping them out? So what is spectacular about pharmacists doing? You're in the medical thing for, for crying out loud. So what is spectacular about that? But the important thing is that I'm not talking about the kind of wound that is beyond you because you have different levels of wounds. The one that you can help patients with, why can't you quickly clean it up for them? It depends. That's why I'm saying that different pharmacies have different modus operandi. We all have, we run things different. It depends on your focus. It depends on your, your model, the model you are. If you are, if you are pharmaceutical oriented, it's just about reading up on these things for crying out loud. If I've been taught in school, maybe we forgot. You can help them. Somebody just had a knife cut. You know, some of them will even treat at home. Or was just coming to your pharmacy and fell and had a bruise on it. So you say you should go to the hospital for what? So I think you can clean it up. You know the right things to use and to make sure that there is just an extra thing you can do. That's what I think. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Doctor. So the next question here is from Fripong Uwusu. Please, Doctor, what's your advice on syphilis treatments? Now for syphilis, I will advise. You may want to refer because syphilis might look simple. But there's much more. If you've read around syphilis, there are different types. Syphilis is so bad that it can remain in the body for a long time and come and, uh, and come and, 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 and follow the patient years after they've not, it has not been well managed. For me, some kind of things that they accept you are highly specialized in that field. I will recommend that you refer to not just any hospital, please. It may be to a teaching hospital where you are sure you'll be able to handle it properly because it's very important. It's very important. If it's not well managed, this thing can stay dormant in the body for a long time. It will say come and haunt the patient. Yes, after they've ignored it. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. For that. So, uh, last question I have here from Adebayo Adini. Please, sir, does pharmaceutical care include agreeing with patients on what medications to take? Thank you for the question. Well, it depends on what you meant by that. The truth is that. We need to let them be involved in your decision taking. If they are, if just like in any organization, if you just, we just 
backing down others down the the the, the power line, and you're not just asking for their opinion. You just say, okay, go and do it now. It's important. Patients should be in, in the in the in the know of anything they are taking. I know that because when uh, working abroad and yeah, I've seen a lot of differences. People just like to be like the, the lion of the tribe of their hospital, their pharmacy. No, now involve them. Involve them. Somebody might say, for instance, now somebody might say, Oh, I have, you know, many people don't even ask them, have you ever had a reaction to a drug before? You don't even bother asking them. You take it for granted. Ordinary, uh, um, ordinary cotimosa. So you don't even bother asking them. They should be involved. They should agree. If they are not interested in that drug, somebody, for instance, I say, oh, I don't like so many drugs. And that's why we have, for instance, different types of drugs. We have different anti It's a different thing if the other options case. Why not? Why not? Why not? And they, they, they are a part of the decision taken. Then they own the decision by themselves and they were wrong with it. That's what I think. Thank you. All right, thank you. And the last one from myself. Okay, During sir. your presentation, doctor, you mentioned yes, that um, pharmacists are well trained, but mm. underutilized. Mm, it's unfortunate. To me, that is an indication that there is a kind of gap between pharmacists and other healthcare providers. Mm. So my question now is, what can be done to close this gap? And fully engage the services of pharmacies in terms of client-led initiative. Hmm. Thank you very much for this very important information question. Programs like what you are doing could also help with that. But beyond that, I want to say that pharmacists, nobody will blow your trumpet for you. You better blow it yourself. Pharmacists should be, be willing to go out and show what they have. Like I told you, a, a, a community pharmacy that has a lot of shame pharmacy in the U.S. was involved in COVID-19 testing, no, not vaccination, testing. And thank God in our own place, I, I want to really celebrate our ACP and see the way they did a lot of training for pharmacists, community pharmacists to be able to undo COVID-19 um, uh, vaccination. Yes, our bodies can work with us on that. That would be very, very good. But also from our own end. Make sure you are fully on ground. You know when opportunity will come. If your opportunity shows up and you are not prepared, then there's going to be a problem. When opportunity shows up and you are prepared, I've seen cases where some opportunity will come up and then I I'm just there to meet up with the need. Then you are able to increase your frontiers as a pharmacist. We are, we are too overtrained. A friend of mine, a pharmacist, also had an issue. And do you know what? She had to pay a, a nurse who is a Nigerian trained nurse who is now working in the UK on weight loss, weight loss program. She trained, she paid a nurse, a Nigerian trained nurse who abroad. And I'm asking myself, what is in um, obesity management? Can't we read up about it? We've been exposed to so many things in our school days. Yes, they may not have taught us about that specific one, but we know how to solve the web from reliable sources. And we can't get all of those things done. So for me, number one, we should increase our level of special. That was what I was saying. For me, in some areas, I have had to go for several trainings within and outside the shorts of this country. And I, I don't play with books. I wish I have an opportunity. The, the, the book, I have one very close to me that is what we used to call it. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to pull it out to see the name by Asuka Opara. It's right with me here on essentials of pharmaceutical care. As if as if, as if I'm a fellow of the West African um, um, College of Pharmacy. And from there, I bought this book. This is the current one. I bought it. I'm very voracious about information because it helps. So that's what I think I should stop at. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Doctor. We really enjoy your presentation and sure, sure. details about the questions asked from our audience. So um, for me, the takeaway from this presentation and to everyone here is we should learn to increase our learning skill, read more about our profession, so we can get more information about our area, I mean, our specialization. 
So this will also increase the pharmaceutical care service. And also, um, in improving the pharmaceutical care service, we should try as much as possible to, I mean, increase our consultation to patients, offer royalty program and also drug therapy. I believe we can work on this point. Um, we should be able to increase the level of pharmaceutical care in our various um, pharmacies, hospital, or other healthcare uh, profession. So thank you so much, everyone on the call. Really appreciate your time here for the past one hour now. So until next time, we meet again on RxL Academy program. My name is Remain Alabi Pius. Thank you so much. And thank you very much, Dr. Ajay. Really appreciate your work. See you next time.